Hello, everyone. Guten Tag, buenos dias, salamat pagi, and so on. The best thing about my book is that it's available for free outside. <laughs> so we're having a signing session later on at the IoT, what is that place? The, I, the IoT Lounge. You know, I'll be sitting there, you know, waiting for you to come by to please relieve me of a copy. Uh, and I can sign it for you and you can sell it for five euros on, on eBay if you want. So, <laughs> It's really a great pleasure to be here today. You know, I was, as I was preparing for this uh, discussion, I was thinking, you know, it's really interesting to see when you cut it down to all of the bottom lines of what we're all about. You know, what is the purpose of business? What is the purpose of life? Well, go back to the old Greek, happiness. Right? And is happiness an algorithm? Right? Can, we, can we have a happiness app? Uh, there are quite a few happiness apps, by the way, that, that you can try. But but would it be that easy? Right? Can we be computed? You know, are we computable as people? And how far should we take it? Are there things that we cannot compute? Are there things that data will not tell us? You know, and there are lots of different opinions on this, obviously, and I've, I've gone through quite a few of them. And you know, when I was preparing, I was thinking already, you know, this thing here that all of us have now, this is our external brain, right? it's our second brain. For some of our kids, it's the first brain. You know? Uh, but basically, this is where we keep our phone numbers, our, our, our dating, right? our, our money, our music, and very soon we keep our intelligence in here. These devices will have a million times the computing power in roughly seven to eight years, and unlimited connectivity. So they become the global brain. Right? And that could be very helpful, but also very disconcerting, because you know, maybe your own brain would stop working. I mean, this is not, it's actually funny, you know, most pilots in airplanes, their brain stops working because they never fly themselves anymore. It's a big problem in the US. It's called the glass cockpit syndrome. Right? So in the US, they actually now have a rule that you have to fly by hand so you don't forget it. Imagine what would what happen if you only use this all the time and just say, hey, you know, a date for tonight, get married next week, and boom, you have a solution. You stop thinking. Right? So, you know, the Internet of Things is this times a million. Uh, the Internet of Things is that we're all building is what I call a new meta-intelligence. Right? It's all of this times a million times everything connected times everything always on, always connected. The benefits are huge. Solve climate change, solve water, solve energy, solve cancer. And I'm, I'm not joking on this, right? This is all within reach on this. And then, all of the other things that are happening as, as sort of a side effect. And I'll talk about what that means and how we can go from here. I have two jobs. I love technology. I've been in tech for a long time. I was an internet entrepreneur. Most of the clients of my company are technology companies and software companies and so on. Many of you are clients. So we, we talk about what the future of tech is. And then there's this minor thing. You know, what does it do to us as people, as governments? And every day goes by now, we see many more disruptions about what's happening around us, fake news, of course, one of those things, the influence of social media. So there's two topics that I work on, and that's essentially the idea of algorithms, you know, technology, and what I call androrhythms in the book. It's very easy to understand. Androrhythms are human things. And as I was writing the book, the list was about 14 pages long, right? Emotions, creativity, design, negotiation, mystery, lying, you know, all all the things are very hard to describe. In fact, you could argue, for example, when we have a conversation, it may be more important what I'm not saying rather than what I'm saying. Try to teach that to a computer. Very difficult. So those are two different worlds. But the reality is humans live in the world of androrhythms. We don't live in the world of algorithms. We use algorithms. Right? As a famous philosopher once said, we should not confuse the tool with the purpose. Right? That's the tool. All of you are building those tools, and we have to make nice tools or power that we can sell. Right? But really what we're trying to do is this. Right? Jack Ma, the CEO of Alibaba, said, it's not the technology that matters, but the dreams behind it. And of course, it's sometimes hard to figure out what those dreams are. But in this world, you know, we can say there's huge game changers, not just the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, brain-computer interfaces. We cannot think of the Internet of Things as a separate thing from artificial intelligence. 
because there's no way we could do anything with this data un unless we have thinking machines. And so it's all very densely interwoven. And the question is, where is it going? I think it's quite clear. We're going into a world that is completely combining technology and people. And it will be you, our choice to see how far you want to go with this. You know, if we, we will leave the Singularity University, some of you, I'm sure, have been there. Their suggestion is, by and large, we merge with technology. I find that rather appalling, I have to say. Often, you know, I'm, I'm European, what can I say? You know, but i would explain quickly. In this world, we're at an exponential point of takeoff. When I first started doing internet stuff in, in 1995, music things mostly, was too early on the curve, you know, doubling 0 0.01, it's still nothing. And now we're at four. So we're going four, 18, 16, 32, seven steps to 128, 30 steps to a billion, straight into the sky. Okay. I mean, the world in 20 years will be so different, I would defy you to figure out to describe to me what it will look like. The kids of my kids will never know how to drive a car themselves. They will certainly not know how, what a CD or a DVD is, you know, those round plastic things, right? Intellectual property, copyright, you know, downloading, remember all the copyright debates? It's laughable now, right? Because it's in the cloud. It's a whole different world. So, man machine symbiosis, or symphony, or singularity, or simulation. Because, you know, when it, when it comes this far, we could easily simulate a reality because we're connected, right? We can just live inside of a virtual thing, as Facebook wants to make us suggest. Not enough that Facebook has distorted the meaning of the word friendship. Now they want to distort reality by us living inside of an augmented reality, right? So they can sell us more ads. I mean, that is it's just amazing, right? It's just, how can you resist? We're going to end up here, right? Becoming as God. You know, I'm, I'm not religious, maybe you are, but we're becoming extremely powerful here. Many of us will in the future do jobs that it took a thousand people to do. Right? Analytics, predictive analytics, using social media engines, you know, sentiment analysis. I mean, this is stuff that just 10 years ago took a whole army in a, in a, in a skyscraper to figure out. Right? So we're becoming extremely powerful, we can do new things. And the question really is, in this world, what is a human? Is that a human? Are we just a fancy machine? Well, I have lots of opinions on this. I wouldn't be asking otherwise. But how computable are we? And are there things that we can't find here when we're computing? Our external brain, we know what's happening. Of course, every single company around the world, including most of those in the room here, are investing seriously serious amount of money in artificial intelligence, right, in building a brain. In fact, the Google project is called the global brain. The attempt is to build a brain. So Facebook, in fact, has a brain of two billion people. That's us right? inside that brain, and they can use that to think. And the next step, of course, is this, right? We already are adoring our technology. Right? We're praying at the altar of technology. And I should be talking because you know, I'm obsessed with the mobile phone. Ask my kids. Right? But that's a little bit harmless. You know, we laugh about this. You know, we wake up at 4 a.m. and set off a tweet or something. You know, or you know, instead of dating, we just Tinder and we get to the result in 20 minutes. But you know, that's, that's amazing. But it's not really it's not really destructive to society. Right? But imagine if this phenomena becomes exponentially powerful in 10 years, and we're talking about several thousand times as big. Could we even exist without the internet? Would we want to get up if we can't connect with our digital cortex? And these are, you know, scientific questions, but connectivity is a religion. The mobile phones are the new cigarettes. So that's basically a way for us to say, now, now it's, this is not even the beginning, right? On the, scale, on the scale of 1 to 100, we're 5 with all that stuff. Because now we have our friend Elon, who's going to make trillions building a neural lace, right? which connects our layers of our, our neocortex to a digital cortex. I mean, that must be the biggest business ever invented, is to reduce humanity and put technology in its place. I mean, it sounds like a winning proposition. but. 
Where is this going? I jokingly call this a sofalarity, no, not the singularity, but the sofalarity. Because <laughs> we don't need a body anymore. We can just sit on the couch and remotely control the life around us. Uh, in fact, as Ray Kurzweil has suggested, we can just have a head. We'll just keep the head, everything else can go. So that's kind of, kind of a disembodiment. But what's happening already today, you know, of course, we're shifting to voice control now. This is a natural user interface. It does not require computing. We speak to machines. Headline of most of the companies that are making those boxes, like Amazon, Echo, Google, and many others, speak to the computer like a friend. Well, you can imagine where this could be going. I'm not going to touch on that, but right? a rapid shift towards kind of interfaces like Amazon Echo, where you know, the Echo knows you better than your wife and says, no, 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 that's not going to happen because, you know, I, <laughs> right? So it's, it's so, you know, it's really amazingly convenient, but it's also kind of weird, right? It's a cultural question. You know, I think six or eight million Americans already have the Echo. And I love the Echo as a box, but the thought of this box listening to me the whole time reminds me of, sort of the, the World War II, you know, Stasi scenario or something. This must be a German problem, but... Anyway, so we're going into the future where this is our reality, eh? and the Internet of Things is just one piece of this. It's an AI that says, you know, I got this su suggestion, like you can do that, you can, you know. And, of course, you can save energy, you can reduce crime. But let me ask you this, would you rather have the politician, not this politician, we're not going to talk about that, right? would you rather have politicians be in artificial intelligence because they would never make a mistake? Well, yeah, is it human to make mistakes, or is it machines don't make mistakes? Well, allegedly, right? Is it heaven or is it hell? Well, it's, of course, like all technology, can be hell, can be heaven. It's up to us to figure it out. Nuclear energy, in theory, you can make power plants or you can build bombs, right? 99.4% the same material, except for the uranium, right? So that's a very big question. Where do we go? And now we're doing this. All of you in this room are doing this. Yeah, we're building a global meta-intelligence, a brain, a digital cortex. And the benefits of this are, I think the latest numbers are like $34 trillion of new revenue shifts. I mean, you heard about the blockchain this morning, which is part of this. Clearly, we must do that. We cannot say, oh, that's yeah, just, you know, it's dangerous, so uh, we're not going to do that. So we have to think about you know, what happens here in this, uh, in this new way of looking at things. You know, what is the next thing? And basically, we're going into a future of what are called cognified machines. You know, we have this joke. Uh, we created this little animation. You, know, you take any old business, you put it in the smart converter. You know, the AI goes on top, and out comes the new business. You know? <laughs> smart city, smart farming, even smart banking. Right? Who would have thought of that? Smart humans? No. Uh, because we can't go in the box. We can't be easily converted. That's the hard part. Humans are really a pain, you know that? It's because humans are so inefficient. Yeah? I mean, we are the epitome of inefficient, right? We have to sleep, we have to eat, you know, we, 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 we do bizarre things, we invent stuff, we have imagination, we tell lies, you know, we're bad drivers, we kill each other. Should we remove all of that if we could? I mean, we, we can, right? Probably can. Is that a good idea? Where do we go next? You know, the temptation of automation. The automation of everything. You know, it used to be in the music business where I worked, the digitization of everything. And now it's the automation of everything. You know, every company you work with, and there's hundreds of companies, all one top objective, fire as many people as possible using technology. Well, every company has the concern. Of course, you know, people are expensive, right? They're inefficient, so they're expensive. And they, they complain even, right? have their own ideas. So the impact of AI and automation will have vastly more challenges than globalization. I mean, this is the real challenge. What do we do then? Is it automating our jobs or just tasks? I think the silver lining here is computers will always take tasks and jobs, you know, basically things that we have to do, but they will not take things that is about us. And I'll explain in a second what I mean with this. But the challenge is really this. Technology is morally neutral, says William Gibson, until we apply it. 
and we apply it everywhere, literally everywhere. Human genome changing, right? The possibility of changing my genes to not have diabetes or cancer, to live to be 150 years old. In, uh, in Silicon Valley, Human Longevity Inc., you may have heard about the company, it sounds like science fiction, it already exists, right? The end of dying. Well, that's fantastic, right? Who needs to die? Who wants to die? But anyway, this is moral, these are moral questions. Of course, we don't know what those morals are because they're completely different. So we have social contracts, we have codes of behavior, we have ethics, hard to define, we have laws and regulations. And I would submit to you, if we go on this exponential trip on technology and we're going to go straight into the sky, if we don't find a way to balance the two, we're going to come to a point where it's kind of you know, we'll have a lot of, of this, and then all of a sudden we have this growing into a huge thing that's out of control. Not just AI, but just how we change. And I'll give you some examples on that shortly. My colleague Luciano Floridi, who is an AI researcher, said something very important. Just the other day he says, algorithms outperform human intelligence when it is not about the human stuff. And there's a long list, you know, understanding mental states, intentions, interpretations, you know, ephemeral stuff, beliefs. So it's very important. We can use Google Maps if it fails, you know, not a big deal. We can book our stuff on Airbnb. We can even have pilots fly. You know, there's lots of uh, proposals to do away with the pilots now because it is possible, right? allegedly. But then we get this, right? The latest incident on United. If you should be so unlucky to fly with United, you know what I'm saying three weeks ago. Right, where a patient was beaten, uh, no, I mean, a passenger was beaten, <laughs> yeah, because the computer said four people have to go, and the computer said we've got $850 to, for them to change their mind, and not more, and people at the gate couldn't do anything about it. Right? The computer decided this. The computer decided to go ahead and then say that there's lottery, and there's a limit, and so on, and the end result, board as a doctor, leave as a patient. Right? That's the Vietnamese guy who was beaten there. You remember that story. So that's kind of a, a side note on what could happen when technology goes wrong. So the biggest challenge in our society is not that technology will come and kill us. You know, forget all the stuff you hear in Hollywood and the robots and X machine, right? That is a long time away. I think that may be the case in 100 years or so, but beyond our horizon, because these machines are pretty stupid and, and they, they are definitely not human in that sense. The biggest thing is that we become like them. That we may start using technology where we shouldn't. And that is a key question of what do we automate, what do we not? Because we live like this. I mean, that's an, an interesting realization when you, the world is actually not as logical as we always make it out to be, right? Because Daniel Kahneman, world-winning psychologist, says, award-winning Nobel Prize, I think, he says, cognition is embodied we think with the body, not the brain. Now, if you remember the movie Her, you seen the movie Her? Right? You know, the problem was in the end, uh, the guy found out that she's having sex with 3,850 other people at the same time because she didn't have a body, right? It's possible. Right? We don't, we have a body, right? We actually think differently. We think in a much more holistic way. So I'm going to propose another definition of artificial intelligence, which is relevant, of course, to the IoT. Quite simple, we have these intelligence, social intelligence. Some of us have that. Right? Emotional intelligence, hard to define what that is. Emotions, right? intellectual intelligence. And then we have this, right? We have artificial, this is a new kind of intelligence. And this is how we should look at it. It's not at all the same like ours. Intelligent machines are not thinking like we are thinking. Right? Let them think whatever they want. We can use them for the grunt work, right? No big deal, but let's not teach them to be emotionally intelligent, uh, even if we could do that. So here's something, I'd, I wonder if you recognize uh, this intelligence at work here. Give you a short audio example. Turn hey, the Don, audio. Have you heard about this new technology? Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Wirebird. This is huge, they can make us say anything, now really anything. The good news is, 
that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? Hey guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural networks. Well, this is not Obama and Trump and Hillary, but it's an, it's an AI that speaks like them. And, and I, could, I know you can tell it's not actually that good. It's pretty close. Give it two years and it's achieved. Over. AI can do that and speak like my wife, right. for example. So, but I wonder about this thing, you know, I think we all in the room have the same concern. I think really what's happening is that exponential technological progress eliminates tasks, routines. You, you can see on the economy graph here, all routine is declining. So it's not so much about our job, it's about how we do our job and which job we do. So if, if your job is all about routine and tasks, of course it'll be gone, you know, like a checkout person at the supermarket. So the key is for us to rise above that, you know, so what if the, if the robot pours the beer, right? The robot is not going to have a conversation at the bar with, with somebody. Right? That's not going to be replaced. So it's about the EQ, the IQ, all the stuff that we can combine. These are the top skills in just five years, right? critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence. And that is the talent we need. We don't just need great engineers and programmers, we need great humans exponential humans that actually have those skills because that is the success factor of a company. You know, I've observed in 15 years of doing this, the number one factor in success is not technology. If you have bad technology, you won't be successful, right? But number one factor is culture, backed up by great technology. I mean, that is obvious to a lot of people, right? But we should look at it from this way. So really, in this world, you know, data is the new oil. You've heard that many times. It's finally true. You see the graph here. In the old days, you know, oil companies and banks, most powerful companies of the world, that's the past. Oil companies are toast pretty soon, right? You know, they switch to solar energy, so they're all trying to jump ship. Obama's pipeline will never, ever be used because nobody's going to want the gas in it, right? And this is the future. Right? Technology platforms, data. But if data is the new oil that feeds the IoT, do we need environmental protection? Nobody likes protection. Right? I mean, clearly, that's a shocking word, just like responsibility. But I'm not talking about greenwashing here or any such thing. I'm talking about if data is the oil and we're making trillions a year with data, do we need a protection that says there's something that is beyond data? Do we need that? Do we need an EPA for humanity? This is a big question, because we may end up here otherwise. You know, unprotected growth of data mining. And this has been referred to in the oil business as externality. So basically, the oil companies have said, you know, who, who cares what happens with the oil or global warming? It's not our problem, because people need the gas to drive their car. So we sell it. Just like in the US, people say, well, people need guns to defend themselves. So it's not our problem if they kill each other. It's their problem. Well, let me say, we can't do this with the IoT. We cannot build a system of a meta-intelligence that connects 8 billion people and you know, 800 billion objects and our brain and our mobile and our bank accounts and then say, well, whatever happens as a you know, burning platform, somebody else should worry about that. Maybe, maybe you, the EU Commission could worry about that, right? That's not going to be that easy. I think we need to come to a place where we look at business like this. Complete overlap of technology, humanity, organization, right? being on the same page. And this is, I think this is really about figuring out what is the future value of a company. Great graph here from Accenture that talks about why we're doing this, right? We can find a way to regulate the issues and address them together. We don't actually need the government for that if we do this. Well, of course, we're always going to need the government for something, right, <laughs> to, to look at this, but... These kind of side effects, for example, de-skilling, right? I mean, it makes you wonder how many skills we're losing if we're just going to use an app and just speak to it, like Google Home. Right? It makes you wonder if our technology is manipulating us. Like, I mean, that's already, frankly, happening everywhere, but not just on Facebook. Right? And then we're wondering, you know, if maybe this kind of filter bubble is everywhere. We're not seeing the truth, really. And where everything becomes a medium, even our sex life and our kids. The computer will suggest if we should have the baby or not. 
based on genetic analysis. That's already a huge debate. I'm sure you're aware of that. Right? And then the insurance will say, no, 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 that's not going to happen because it will be expensive. Right? So clearly in this world, this is what's happening in this, in this graph. You can see right here the enormous benefit of technology on this scale and the uh, unintended consequences. Artificial intelligence, robotics, and the Internet of Things are right in the top corner. Right? Very powerful, potentially very difficult. Huge un unintended consequences, AI clearly. Right? So this is a question I have for you. Would you agree that we have an ethical imperative? Or are you going to argue that these are externalities and somebody else can mop them up? Right? Well, the argument will be fair, right? I'm not saying we shouldn't make the argument. But should we have that to harness the power to serve the collective good, which everybody in Silicon Valley talks about the collective good, but you know what happens when Mark Zuckerberg writes his manifesto, he says, oh man, I've created a monster. There's nothing you can do. So there's something that we have to think about, you know, where is, where is this going? Huh? Who has control and ultimately, who's mission control for humanity? Who's controlling what we do, where the data is, what the rules are? Well, right now, that is Silicon Valley. I mean, it's obvious, right? So lucky us, but you know, this is a, an interesting question. You know, Microsoft started having servers in Germany for that reason, to move the mission control to Europe. Right? So, and then we have inequality. I mean, all of you know, of course, been reading on that has been plenty lately. Technology has increased inequality. Look at this graph here, <clears throat> and that what's happening here. You can see the country with the most IoT devices, Korea, Switzerland, US, the rich countries. Will African countries have the Internet of Things? Will it be possible for them to actually do this? Looking at this graph, it's going to get worse. <clears throat> and clearly, sorry, just a second here, getting too excited. And, uh, So clearly, in this direction, we have to ask the question, you know, inequality is the number one, number one reason for terrorism. And we're creating it by the plenty. It's something we have to look at, clearly where it's going. So I'll come to the end and wrap up, and we'll have a short conversation afterwards. The bottom line is this, right? This is the era of digital ethics. Everything is interdependent. We can no longer say, well, we built this, it works great, we make lots of money, and that's it, right? We can't do that. Because now, we're touching on the very basis of humanity. We're going inside of our body, changing our genes, changing our brain, using AI, connecting everything. Then we can't just say, you know, well, so what? It's just like having a steam engine, right? Not quite. Right? This is the world of mega shifts, which I describe in the book, which we will faithfully read afterwards, I'm sure. Right? All the stuff that's happening there. Great quote here. Ethics is the difference between having the right or the power to do something and to do what is the right thing to do. And that is business. That's wise business. Because you have the power to do something and you do the right thing, you actually are better off in the end. Something that the old companies failed to see. So the future of technology, future of what we're doing is kind of what I call a hell van. You know, it's hell and heaven. Really, it can be both. Right now, we're at 90-10. 10% hell, you know, privacy, surveillance, a little bit of hell, not much. We don't want that to grow exponentially. Right? As Jack Ma says again about the dreams behind technology, how do we keep that mix alive? Do we need a global ethics council? And who would that be? And would we even agree on the ethics that we have? I mean, we would agree on bottom line ethics like a machine should not kill people without human supervision. I think if we took a vote on that, everybody would, except for the people who make the machine, you know, we would agree on that. And there are people who make that machine. Right? So let me say a final thing. Technology is often confused with the utter tool of optimization and efficiency. This is totally wrong. What we're doing here with the Internet of Things is not about efficiency. That's just a side effect. The CFO likes it. Right? We should never put efficiency over humanity. It, the purpose of what we're doing is to create human value. Relationships, trust, 
added value, meaning, purpose, a general improvement. And efficiency is one of those things that we, we use for money. You know, that, that's a good thing, but it's not the final destination. Very important to keep that in mind. Okay? The Asilomar principles, I won't have the time to go through this. You should read them yourself, the feature of life. They apply very well to IoT. Right? Human values, shared benefits, ecosystem thinking, responsibility. Absolutely crucial for us to go in that direction to understand what we're trying to do here. And I think that your position, whatever company you're with, on this issue is the number one issue of success in the future. What is your position on the man-machine polarization? How much are you on team robot or team human? As it's been called, right? there's been a, a term cooking for this. But you know, if you make robots, of course you're on team robot, right? <laughs> but you can still be on team human and make robots, obviously. Well, difficult question. I think this is obviously something we have to define and think about where this is going. So I think it's important that we have to invest as much in humanity as we're investing in technology. And I don't mean humanity in the sense of, of, of writing artworks or books, right? The people you hire have to be exponential humans to be successful in this future. Right? Not just great tech people. Right? Not just the left brain. Because right? that's really what we need. I mean, in five years, computers will program computers. In 10 years, we have AI scientists. We already have them. Will they replace scientists? Not really, but they'll do a lot of the grunt work, right? So really powerful stuff that we have to think about. I'll summarize and then we'll take some questions. Oh, we'll have a short debate. First, a holistic approach will win. Holistic in the sense of externalities, balanced systems, interdependence, and investment in algorithms and algorithms. And I think this is really where things are going. Ultimately, we have exponential technologies that are not about efficiency, they're about transformation and general what I call human flourishing. Right? And that has to go into the business plan. I mean, I think you're aware that roughly in five to ten years we're going to look at the change of uh, uh, economic system, economic logic, because of technology. Right? Technology creates abundance, like music, like films, like... And what's going to happen then? Right? We have to think about those things as well. Stewardship. I mean, this is a wide open position. All of you having stewardship and saying this is the future where pro-action can meet precaution. The key future talents will be emotional intelligence, being human. That's the people we want to hire. So the best possible combination would be, of course, somebody who's a brilliant engineer and a brilliant human. You know, Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. I think that was very easy to say for Einstein, you know, considering that he had a lot of knowledge. You know, of course you have to have knowledge. Right? But in the future, knowledge is kind of a thing. You know, a lot of computers will have knowledge. I mean, binary knowledge, which is really not much, right? But they will have knowledge that they can read two million books in a minute. Well, that's the kind of knowledge that we can't really compete with. So we need to seriously consider a global mission control. We can't just leave this issue hanging up there and saying, you know, well, it will self-regulate. It will not. When we're talking about $43 trillion here, this will not self-regulate. So that's something to think about where this is going. I hope you like uh, my summary. This is from the book. I'd always like to say embrace technology, but don't become it. Have a nice day.